Peace forever and always. I'm so sister J. I'm so sister D. And I just wanted to say thank you for all the people who helped to the medical fundraiser for my uncle to leak. And it has been so much to us that you would help because without you guys, his life would not be possible and we would not be with him today right now. And I just wanted to say for all of you that helped and that donated, I would really would like to give a big thanks. And I hope I can meet you one day and say thank you in person. I love you guys very much. Okay, thank you for donating to uh, my uncle Tally. I ordered this book, God is on trial. I ordered this book from Amazon, and I must say I read it. It's very well written, very thought provoking. We want to make sure that we're not just working to be first, but we're working to be right. A lot of times there are situations when things are just happening so fast. It's always important to be fast, but we always want to be right.
message. Hey, my brother, you know I had to call you. And thank you personally again. I cannot describe to you how happy I was to meet you in person, by the way. That was just like amazing. Gomane, assemble the people, Gomane. We will not be defeated by witch doctor's illusions. Gomane, assemble the people, Gomane. We will not be defeated by witch doctor's illusions. Gomane, assemble the people, Gomane. We will not be defeated by witch doctor's illusions. Gomane, assemble the people, Gomane. We will not be defeated by witch doctor's illusions. And uh, just then, the gunfire went off. Malcolm's death never sat right with me. The investigation was a failure. Asking who's guilty is a dangerous question to ask. What is the real story? It's in the history book. Leave it there. Leave it alone. Elijah Muhammad told everybody, do not raise a hand against Malcolm X. He didn't have to give the order. Someone would take care of him. The FBI should have known. Why doesn't someone want to get to the bottom of this? They never had any intentions of seriously investigating that assassination. That is my mission. I'm not going to stop until I get justice. Because the official count of who killed Malcolm X, it's not true. Set in Philadelphia, follow Camille Ebony as she discovers the woman she was meant to be in the blink of an eye, seemingly when her marriage, career, and life are rearranged, when a cool stranger enters the mix. She realizes for the first time in her life that she is able to throw caution to the wind and just be herself without any label or duties attached. All things must come to an end, though, 
And once again, Camilla finds herself taking on the requirements now of wife and mother. But when she is called upon to do one more favor, the journey to the heart of the matter continues, and she comes face to face with the realities of the girl she once was, the person she has wanted to be, and the woman she is. On the road to self-discovery, Camille soon realizes there must be some casualties. When the documentary, Oh My God, Master Farad, came out by Shabazz Productions, it stunned anyone who dared to watch it. That was on April 20th, 2012, and it contained over four hours of mind-blowing material. Many people didn't want it to be seen. So to stop the bleeding, those who didn't want the truth out immediately began to criticize the film. Oh, my God, Master Farad, the one who was incarcerated. Now the film is even stronger. It's been expanded with three extra DVDs with even more powerful information, new photos, and much more. Don't wait. Get the documentary now. Get it while it's available in its purest form or make the mistake of searching for a copy five years from now when it's selling for over $300. You know, one of those bootleg copies that's been re-edited and all chopped up. You were advised. See an all-new stunning photograph of Master Farad at the time of his arrest and who was also arrested seated next to him. See the grave site and location where Master Farad, the man who taught Elijah Muhammad, is buried. This all new five DVD nine hour documentary is a researcher's oh dream oh come God. true. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's an educational masterpiece. Operation Exodus, Mississippi. What is OEM? It is the only real solution for descendants of slaves born in America. The original Mississippi campaign. Anything else is fraud and will not work. It is the process of bringing into reality the promised land that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of. It is simply inspiring the so-called black residents of the state to take advantage of their voting power having a large population to take control of the political systems, laws of their state, to benefit themselves, of which brings them power, power they never had before. OEM has nothing to do with religious, personal, or political beliefs. Just wanting to make life less oppressive in this geographical area so blacks can feel safe and operate with less resistance due to racism forming a type of safe haven sanctuary state for black people. OEM doesn't advocate trying to force the populace to do anything they don't wish to do, but offer advice and suggestions to improve their state for all citizens, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, etc. Some of the benefits of OEM could be, one, as a state, you could finally request reparations due to the enslavement of our ancestors from the federal government. Being such, monetary or other awards will not be going to individuals or groups, but a state now in control that benefits this people to help build what this people need to act like true, free, liberated, as well as equal citizens of this nation. Two, having control of the governor's mansion, you can control the state national guard as well as all law enforcement of the state. Three, create a different way of living among the people to alleviate homelessness and other poverty, requesting the citizens more modestly, opening up more jobs, more time with loved ones. Four, offer true rehabilitation to those in criminal systems so monies on jails can go to more beneficial purposes. Five, state can request the federal government to release all political prisoners in federal custody or those forced into asylum 
in foreign lands to be returned to or handed to Mississippi so they can live out the rest of their lives in dignity. Six, Mississippi will become a true work state where every man, woman, and child can say they had something to do with the success of their state instead of credit going to a select few. Seven, being an agriculture state already, we can specialize in the production of pure organic foods that is good for our citizens, also can be exported to other states and around the world, having a want for cheaper organically grown food products. Eight, success of OEM will become the blueprint an example, having not enough room for all who now wish to move. So our eyes must be set upon perhaps Alabama, Georgia, and the like. Nine, a state can function independently from the federal government, forming relations and deals in foreign lands like Africa to benefit the state and nation. The so-called black people of America have never had true power that others respect. But by doing this, we will get the respect and power we have never experienced and the doors that will open due to just taking control of your life, we can't imagine. Please be reminded, if not for the domestic terrorism, targeting black people of the South and the federal government refusing to protect its citizens, forcing them to flee, this OEM campaign probably would have been made a reality generations ago. So all you and I will be doing is the work our ancestors wanted to do, but couldn't do, due to domestic violence from other citizens. Join and organize Operation Exodus Mississippi today, or become a supporter. What will your people do now, Jimmy Swan? How will their mind explain that which a mind cannot grasp? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
na wezu. Zilegazi. Then Dwanves, Queen Dombaz. Gomane. A mystery, Shaga. As usual, guards were posted at the gates of the crawl and at the entrance to the king's hut. They swear that no one was anywhere near the king last night, apart from his private maidservant. And I don't think a woman could have the strength. The guards are lying, Goman. I doubt that, Shaga. They are your men. You trained them. No one could have slipped past them unnoticed. What are you saying, Goman? That it didn't happen? I am merely suggesting that the way it happened may have nothing to do with human error. Nonsense. <clears throat> what we think, Shaga, is of little importance. What matters now is what the people are thinking. And what is their reaction, Goman? They won't even enter the hut to prepare the body for burial. It's true, Shaka. They feel that whoever had the power to kill Tingiswayo under the noses of our best guards has the power to put a curse on all our armies. Gomane. Assemble the people, Gomane. We will not be defeated by witch doctors' illusions. must avenge his death. Wipe the Ndwandos from the face of the earth. Zide would like us to believe that witchcraft was involved in the death of Tingiswayo. Yet the truth lies elsewhere. Our beloved Paramount Chief met his death in treachery, not witchcraft. His royal guards and the maid servant have confessed to their betrayal. And for that crime, they'll suffer the maximum punishment. Impalement. Their bodies will hang over there as a testimony to all of what awaits those who betray us. Now, return to your training. And let there be no more talk of witchcraft. Yangizwa. Security!
the white man pays Reverend Martin Luther King, subsidizes Reverend Martin Luther King, so that Reverend Martin Luther King can continue to teach the Negroes to be defenseless. That's what you mean by nonviolent. Be defenseless. Be defenseless in the face of one of the most cruel uh, beasts that has ever taken the people into captivity. That's this American white man. And they have proved it throughout the country by the police dogs and the police clubs. A uh, hundred years ago, they used to put on a white sheet and use a bloodhound against Negroes. Today, they have taken off the white sheet and put on police uniforms. They've uh, traded in the bloodhounds for police dogs, and they're still doing the same thing. And just as Uncle Tom, back during slavery, used to keep the Negroes from resisting the bloodhound or resisting the Ku Klux Klan by teaching them to, to love their enemy or pray for those who use them despitefully. Today, uh, Martin Luther King is just a 20th century or modern Uncle Tom or a religious Uncle Tom who is doing the same thing today to keep Negroes defenseless in the face of attack that Uncle Tom did on the plantation to keep those Negroes defenseless in the, in the face of the attack of the Klan in that Well, day. I don't think of uh, love as, uh, in this context, as emotional bosh. I don't think of it as uh, a weak force, but I, I think of love as something strong and that uh, organizes itself into powerful uh, direct action. Now, this is what I try to teach in the struggle in the South, that uh, we are not engaged uh, in a struggle that means we sit down and do nothing. Uh, that there's a great deal of difference between non-resistance to evil and non-violent resistance. Uh, Non-resistance leaves, uh, leaves you in a state of stagnant passivity and deadened complacency, wherein non-violent resistance means that you do resist in a very strong and determined manner. And I think some of the uh, criticisms of uh, non-violence, or some of the critics, fail to realize uh, that we are talking about something very strong, and they confuse non-resistance with non -violence. The goal of Dr. Martin Luther King is to give Negroes a chance to sit in a segregated restaurant beside the same white man who had brutalized them for 400 years. The goal of Dr. Martin Luther King is to get Negroes to forgive the people who have brutalized them for, uh, for 400 years by by lulling them to sleep and making them forgetting what those whites have done to them. But the masses of black people in America today don't go for what Martin Luther King is, is putting down. As you said in one of your articles, it's psychologically insecure, or something of that sort. I forget how you put it. But you didn't endorse what Martin Luther King was doing yourself. Uh, I do not reject his goals of full integration and full equality rights for American citizens. Do you reject these if goals? If you don't think that he's walking on the right road, I'm quite sure you don't agree that he'll get to the right place. And if you would classify uh, his method as uh, psychologically unrealistic, I think that uh, if a man's method is psychologically unrealistic, which means the road or the means or the method that he's using, I think as a psychologist, you, you'd be very doubtful I don't think that that's he would reach true. the right. If anyone has ever lived with a nonviolent movement in the South, from Montgomery on through the Freedom Rides and through the sit-in movement and the recent Birmingham movement and see the reactions of many of the uh, extremists and reactionaries in the white community, uh, he wouldn't say that this movement makes, uh, or this philosophy makes them comfortable. Uh, I think it arouses uh, a sense of shame within them often in many instances. I think it uh, does something to cut, touch the conscience and uh, establish a sense of guilt. Now, so often people respond to guilt by engaging more in the guilt evoking act in an attempt to drown the sense of guilt. But this, uh, this approach certainly uh, doesn't make the white man feel comfortable. I think it disturbs the other this, thing. Uh, conscience and uh, it, uh, it disturbs this, this sense of contentment. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And uh, with the Supreme Court, if the NAACP can tell me that they want a desegregation decision for me uh, 10 years ago, but yet the schools haven't been desegregated, as I say, this is a victory with no victory. Uh, it's a victory that you can talk about, but it's a victory you can't show me. So if you represent the NAACP and you are telling me about this great victory you won for me, when I look at you, I have to uh, conclude that either you have been duped yourself or else you are trying to dupe me. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain 
practical gains that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years. I don't think there's any real organization to the riots. I think they grow out of the conditions that I've mentioned uh, all along. And as long as these intolerable conditions are there, as long as the Negro finds himself living every day in a major depression, uh, then uh, every city will sit on a, a powder keg and can explode over the slightest incident. I feel that killing is a very tragic way to deal with any social problem. There is no violent solution to the problem that the Negro confronts in this country. And this is why I have constantly said that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. After all, the Negro ends up uh, on the losing end. We can't win a violent revolution. Most of the persons killed in riots are Negroes themselves. Uh, the persons who end up not being able to get chil uh, milk for their children of Negroes uh, because things where they have to live are destroyed. So there's no uh, practical or moral answer uh, in the realm of violence to the Negro's problem. But I do understand the sociological, the psychological, and the economic the reasons. The problem can be solved. First, the white man and the black man have to be able to sit down at the same table. The white man has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of that Negro. And the so-called Negro has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of the white man. Then they can bring the issues that are under the rug out on top of the table and take an intelligent approach to get the problem solved. That's the only way that they'll ever do it. We need an action program while we are Muslims, and while, while we are Christians, or while we are whatever we are. We still need an action program that will eliminate these evils that are in our community. This is what we're trying to do with the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Do you consider yourself militant? <laughs> I consider myself Malcolm. <laughs> well, I think we uh, have to agree that uh, this appears to be uh, the result of an internal conflict within the black nationalist movement. So I think the first thing that needs to be done is for a conference of goodwill to take place between uh, black nationalist leaders. This was why I suggested a few days ago that the followers of the late Malcolm X and the followers of Elijah Muhammad uh, should sit down at the peace table together, so to speak, uh, and discuss this problem and try to reach some understanding. Uh, I don't think, uh, and I'm sure, uh, that uh, nothing can be accomplished by violence. Uh, it only leads to new and more complex social problems. I think it is unfortunate uh, for the black nationalist movement. I think it is unfortunate for the health of our nation. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I, I'm really happy for you. I'm let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. Let's be honest. If black folks are going to get reparations, then they're going to need a four-star general's approach to it. It will have to be approached in a organized, sustained, military-like way. A flamethrower of a man will have to be the keynote speaker concerning reparations. Brother Malcolm would have been the perfect man to go into the United Nations to pressure the power structure to give us reparations. But he's no longer with us, and his brothers who helped stop him haven't picked up the tab. They weren't serious. If reparations is going to be addressed, then a serious individual like this brother named Talik Ibn Rod should be sent to the UN to speak before the General Assembly. Talik has the qualifications to be taken serious. He's been consistent in his seriousness. He's a man that's not going to go into the UN and bite his tongue. He's going to express how he really feels. He won't modify his delivery. He won't flip the script, buck, bow, smile, and beguile. He'll let the power structure know how black people really feel. 
and why they need restoration for the mental and spiritual destruction done to all of us. Go get him. Wake him up in the middle of the night and bring him to New York. He'll come in a clean but wrinkled undershirt with a loose-fitting collar. He might come in a robe, maybe in a suit. He might drive a truck to the U.N. But you can rest assured, Talik will be coming as himself. And once the world hears him, the fight for what black folks need will be over. It doesn't matter if Talik is the opening or the keynote speaker. All you have to do is hear him and you'll be hooked. What? Meet you at the old Autobahn so we can rally up and organize the people? Haven't you heard that place is always closed? The old ones in the power structure vowed that they would never again give the people that kind of space to assemble. They are scared of Malcolm's ghosts now returning to the crime scene. That's why that place is always closed. This is Dusty Basement Studios, and we approve of this message. I keep it real! What dear? Because I keeps it real like that. I keeps it real! But John Henry Falk may have experienced the most profound effect. He was a graduate student when he interviewed the former slaves, including the two women you hear in this broadcast. Himself interviewed just before he died in 1979, Falk was going on about how he believed in giving blacks the right to go to school, giving them the right to vote, giving them the right to go into anything they qualified for. And then he said, he experienced an epiphany. I was sitting out on a wagon tongue with this old black man and was telling him what a different kind of white man I was. I remember him looking at me very sadly and kind of sweetly and condescending and said, you know, you still got the disease, honey. I know you think you're cured, but you're not cured. You can't give me the right to be a human being. I'm born with that right. Now you can keep me from having that. If you've got all the policemen and all the jobs on your side, you can deprive me of it. But you can't give it to me, because I was born with it just like you was. And my God, it had a profound effect on me. I was furious with him. But the more I reflected on it, the more profoundly it affected me. And I realized this was where it really was. I'll tell you the truth, when I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. I remember that just as well. Look like to me, I can't. We've been slaves all our lives, and mother was a slave, and sisters were slaves, father was a slave. They know nothing about reading right there. All that I know, they teach you to mind your master and your missus. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after she was broke, just turned, just like he turned some out, you know, didn't know where to go. They are haunting voices from the past. Not actors reading a script or scholars reading a text but the actual voices of men and women, Americans, who were born in slavery. My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. Some people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. He won't slip on the floor. Tied it here and tied it there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people. We didn't we didn't know nothing. Didn't like looking no book. Harriet Smith, 
remembering what she saw as a small girl during the final days of the Civil War. We said, oh, that's the on that picket fence. All day long, seeing them soldiers going back to silence home in different places. Colored soldiers, colored soldiers in Joe. That's right along by our house. Our home is a two story house. The white people. These recorded memories we were among thousands of interviews oh, done see. with ex slaves in the 1930s and 40s. Can you remember slavery days very well? Of course, I remember all our white folks and all the names of them, all the children. Call everyone the children's name. Who, who did you belong to? Jim Button, the baby boy. The results of these digitally enhanced recordings are arresting, almost unbelievable. The idea of hearing the voices of actual slaves from the plantations of the Old South is as powerful, as startling really, as if you could hear Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee speak. Listen again to Fountain Hughes, who was born in 1848. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that, have an auction bench and they put you on, up on the bench and bid on you the same as you're bidding on cattle, you know. Much of what these three former slaves say may at first seem unremarkable. Much of what they say may surprise and upset, and their calm demeanor is at odds with the evil and violence we associate with slavery. Here is 91-year-old Texan Laura Smalley talking in the 1940s about the outcome of a tussle between two women, one black, one white, one slave, one mistress. The mistress tried to slap the slave, but the black woman pushed her into a chair. Laura Smalley was a girl at the time, but she remembers vividly what happened to the black woman when the master came home. Well, they taken that old woman, poor old woman, cat in the peach orchard, and whipped her. And, you know, just tied her hand this way, you know, around the peach orchard tree. I remember that just as well, looked like to me, I can't, and around the tree, and whipped her. And, well, she couldn't do nothing but just kick her feet, you know, just kick her feet. But it, it just had a clothes off down to her waist, you know. Just didn't have her plumb naked, but they had her clothes down to her waist. And every now and then they'd whip her, you know, and then snuff the pipe out on her, you know. Snuff the pipe out on her. You know, the embers in the pipe. I'm where you'll see the pipe smoking. Blow them out on her? Mm-hmm. Good Lord, mm -hmm. The plantation on which Smalley was a slave sounds brutal. She recalls scrambling with other children for food from a huge wooden tray like a hog trough. All of them, you know, would get around that tree with spoons and eat something like moist or soup or something like that. And all of them children get around there and just eat, 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 eat. Fountain Hughes tells his interviewer about the relentless round of work for him on a Virginia plantation. The night never come out. You had nothing to do. Time to cut tobacco. If they want you to cut all night long out in the field, you cut. And if they want you to hang all night long, you hang, you hang your back. It didn't matter about your tired being tired, you're afraid to say you're tired. It was cotton, not tobacco, that solidified slavery, though. The invention of the cotton gin at the end of the 18th century made its processing easy, but the crop still needed enormous amounts of unskilled labor. Control of the slave and his labor through laws and regulations became paramount. Fountain Hughes talks about one of those controls, the pass system. Now I couldn't go from here across the street. Well, I couldn't go to nobody's house without I have a note or something from my master. And if I had that pass, I don't want to call it a pass. If I had that pass, I could go wherever he sent me, and I'd have to be back. You know, when I, whoever he sent me to, they, they'd give me another pass, and I'd bring that back, so it's a show how long. Even emancipation didn't truly free the slaves. Freedom freed slaves for more travail. The end of the Civil War found many cast adrift without skills and no place to go. And the Yankees who freed them 
weren't always seen as benevolent liberators. I remember when the Yankees came along and took all the good horses and took all the, sort of all the meat and flour and sugar and stuff out in the river and let it go down the river. And they know the people who wouldn't have nothing to live on, but they done that. The ex-slaves left one hell for another, perhaps an even more dangerous one. No longer property, they didn't have the protections afforded property. When we were slaves, we couldn't do that, see? Mm -hmm. And if we got free, we didn't know nothing to do. And my mother, she then she hunted places and bound us out for a dollar a month. But we didn't have no property, we didn't have no home. We had nowhere, nothing. We didn't have nothing on it, just to light your cattle. We were just turned out and uh, get along the best you could. In Texas, the slaves weren't told they were free until two months after the war ended. Smalley remembers that her masters gave the slaves a dinner, and then they were free. I don't hide the other side of the folks you know freedom. We didn't know. They just thought, you know, we're just feeding us, you know. Some of them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke, just turned, just like he turned something out, you know. They didn't know where to go. But just where to stay. Mm -hmm. right. Didn't know where to go. Turn us out just like, you know, you turn out cattle. <laughs> In the narratives, the slaves used an interesting phrase for the end of slavery. They say, when the break came. Good times, easy times were not at hand. The trials for millions of black Americans didn't end in 1865. They continued. Laura Smalley and her family became sharecroppers. Harriet Smith's first husband was killed by whites during the Reconstruction, probably because of his political organizing. Fountain Hughes went north to Baltimore and worked at numerous jobs, including hauling manure. Not an enviable job, but it was the job of a free man.
I am my man and I am Moses, raised up an old time by my mother, my old master and mistress, raised. My master was named Louis Moses. My mistress was named Blanche Moses. Well, are you ready for me to talk? Yeah, that's fine. And uh, and uh. After my mother was a housewoman, and uh, this after she died, my father was field hanging, them, and white folk kept me around the house to talk cool water, house boy like, and uh, they had two weavers weaving, had two them running every day. Well, you know I'd go out in the quarter to play with them kill other children. And if I hurt one, and they caught me, they would wear me out. Well, the, the white folk told me, when they get at me, make it to the yard. And sometimes I'd go out there and get your plane, and one would hit me, I'd get a break. Mail it to them, to the yard I made. Don't nothing say it like that, yeah. And, uh, I went all that way, and, uh, and then again, now, uh, my master was named Lewis, you got that, and I had a master named, a young master named Lige Molder, he was a doctor. Beth Molder, he was a farmer. Frank Molder, he was a farmer. Joe Molder, he was a farmer. Well, I had two mistresses, Betty Molder and May Jane Molder. Then was my mistress. And then, as I went on to tell you about, the maid lasses way back then, and uh, they had no iron mill like got made wood, had carpenters made wooden mill. And they grind that lasses, and they had to vap be killed to make it in, you know, had a point to expect to kill us on. And when that lasses was made, they had poplar troll to pull that lasses in. No barrel to tow. And I never see the barrel long then, yeah. nothing but troll. And when they get your lasses made, they had plank to cover them troll. Oh, for cover. Well, you told me something about the way they made soap in the old days. Yes, sir. I can explain that. Now, I was large enough to tote water to the soap mix and put on ash hopper. They had a bad, uh, had a bad, uh, had a bad, uh... You ready? You're talking about soap mix, huh? Yeah? You're talking about the soap. soap now, when I was a boy, they used to make soap. Well, I was large enough to tote water to the soap maker to put on ash hopper. Now, they didn't have no bad, they had boards, you know, and uh, their boards coming that way, you know, that way, boards are fast. Well, on each end, they lay some causeway to hold the ashes. And then I'd tote water and put on that la ash hopper for the soap maker. I did make soap for the whole plantation, and uh, make it by two or three buys. And long then came, I ain't seen no, no bar soap. The mother had some, but I never seen none. And uh, they uh, had uh, something dug in the ground, a hole, deep hole, and walled up on each side of the plank. Well, this is about three foot deep, I reckon, and now I can come out about eight or ten foot long. Well, they tan leather. They lay a, lay a bark down in that hole, and then they lay a layer hide over that bark. And then they would lay a, another layer bark and another layer hide, till they got it like they want. And then they'd fool that thing up with water. But now, now for they tan that level, they had a place to put it into 
live a while and get to hell. And when he got on that level, it's just like any tan level. And they had a man that would make shoes for all of us. Now we was children, good sized children, going about that shoemaker made shoes for we children. And the old folk too. We had mighty good white folk. The mom members, as far as I could remember, you know, mighty good. Mighty good. You know, they must have been good after the country surrendered. Didn't none move, more move there after surrender. One moved to own the place. What happened after surrender? Sir? What happened after surrender? What happened? Yeah. Well, now, they tell me to a uh, year for the folk know that uh, they was free. And when they found out they was free, they worked on shares, they tell me. Worked on shares. Didn't rent no land. They worked on shares. Now, you know, I was a boy, I'm going to explain it the best of my understanding. They say the weight gone shield. I think they said to, what, the fourth or third, I think. He got the third, I think they said, what they made after surrender. How many children do you have? Me? Yeah. Ain't got, didn't have but one, he died. None but one, he died. Now, we were living 20 miles this side of Selma in Dallas. That's why I was birthed. I won't birth down here. No, I won't birth down here. How old were you when you came into G's Bend? How old I was? 17 years old. 17 years old. And I've come into being a man here named. John Petty was here when I come, but the first owner of this place, that I know nothing about it, but I hear the older people, was Mark Petty. Mm -hmm. Not uh, uh, Charles G. was the first owner. Well, that was Petty, old man Mark's brother-in-law, tell me. Well, after old man G, Mark took place, Mark Petty. And then that, when I come here, this saying his son, John, had prayed. I don't know about old man Mark and Charles G. But old man and John Pedro, he was, he was a good man. He stayed here. I stayed here with him. Then he died. He'd been dead for some odd years. And uh, another thing about it. Now, he had ten wig hands and uh, four plowers and, and six whole hands. Never had a ride over him the whole time. Now he'd get up soon of a morning and ride round. Now, uh, what? We'd be, if the sun be a half hour high before you left home, he'd be in the field. That he would. And you know he'd make good crops? Now he'd go soon of a morning, about 8 o'clock. He done been all around to his renters and to his wig hand and making it out to the house. And late in the evening, he'd go back again. Now, he had a colored man for his foreman to the whole hand, and a colored man here to the plowers. That's what they said. Now, now, he'd make plenty of corn with them ten hands and forty and fifty bales of cotton. He what? had them right over. What's the, the government doing for you now? Sir? What is the government doing for you now? For me? Yeah. It gives me clothes. Seventeen gives me five dollars a month. They treat me all right. I don't find a better for that. Yeah, I've got, I don't have to buy no clothes at all. Photos of slavery from the past that will horrify you. Number one, The Slave's Shackle, 1907. This is a horrifying photo. It is a picture of a British sailor removing the shackles on a slave's ankle in 1907. In order to keep the slaves in line during the journey from Africa, they had to keep them in shackles. This was to keep the slaves from running away. A very sad photo. Number 2. A Woman and Her Slaves When you first look at this photo, 
you wouldn't know that the men are slaves judging by the way they are dressed. The major clue is when you look down at their feet and you see they have no shoes on. In the 1860s, slaves were not allowed to wear shoes. Number 3. Slave Children Seeing photos of adult slaves is bad enough, but seeing child slaves is completely heartbreaking. Fortunately, by the time these children grew up, slavery was abolished. This gave them both a chance at a happy and productive life. Number 4. The African Slave Ship Of all the photos of slavery from the past that will horrify you, this is possibly the worst. Back in slave days, ships went to Africa and they pulled these poor people from their homes to put them on ships and bring them overseas to be slaves. The number of Africans on the ship is heartbreaking. Number 5. U.S. Prisoners Forced to Be Slaves This is a photo of United States prisoners who were captured and forced to be slaves during the war. The Japanese treated these poor people badly until they were either killed or freed. This photo shows you how horrible things were back then. Number 6. Sex Slaves Training for Military Duty There are so many sad things about this picture it's difficult to know where to begin. The girls in this photo are sex slaves and they look like they are no older than 15 years old. These girls should be in high school, hanging out with their friends, studying and preparing for college. Instead, they are forced to be sex slaves. The Japanese needed as many soldiers as they could get, so they trained the sex slaves to fight in battle. There aren't too many photos more shocking than this one. Number 7 freed slaves. Of all the pictures we've shown you so far, this one is the only one that shows some hope. In the top picture, you see a bunch of slaves wearing no shirts and no shoes. The photo on the bottom is of the same men after they were freed. They were fully clothed, wearing hats and reading the newspaper. This must have been a great day for these men. Number 8. The Worst Men in the World this is a photo of three Arabian slave dealers. It was their job to buy and sell human beings as slaves. These men are as bad as they come. There's no excuse for forcing a person into slavery and then making money for it. Number 9. Human Zoos In 1899, people took Selknam natives and used them in human zoos. This is one of the most inhumane things a person could ever do. The idea of putting people in cages so that the owners of the zoo can get paid by people to walk around looking at them is horrible. The poor people in these human zoos were not treated like humans at all. They had all of their human rights stripped away the second they were put into cages. Number 10. Tall Women Punished in China In China, women were only supposed to grow so tall. Those who grew too tall were punished by spending their days standing with a door with holes over their heads and through their shoulders. It is very sad that back then people were punished for the way they looked. Today, women in China are not punished for being too tall. Many tall women actually get very high-paying jobs as models. Number 11. Slaves in Brazil Brazil is a very popular place for coffee crops. Today, people are paid to work in the fields and harvest those crops. The working conditions are safe today and they work reasonable hours. Sadly, years ago, the Brazilian coffee growers used slaves who they forced to work in the fields all day with no pay and horrible working conditions. This is a photo of the slaves working in the fields under the worst conditions possible. Number 12. Irish Slaves Africans were not the only people that were used as slaves a century or two ago. This is a picture of Irish slaves. They weren't treated as poorly as some slaves as they were given shoes and clothes to wear, but they were still slaves. Number 13. The Slave Convention Before slavery was abolished, there was a slave convention. It was a group of people who worked hard to get slavery abolished. This is a photo of a few of the members who eventually were successful. These women may have been slaves once, but eventually they became heroes. Number 14. Amazonian Slaves 
This is a photo of four people from an Amazonian tribe who were used as slaves. This is a very sad photo. They were stripped of their clothes and chains were put around their necks. This photo shows just how horrible these people were treated simply because of where they lived. Subscribe for more. I keep it real. What dear? Cuz I keeps it real like that. I keeps it real. <laughs>